All right, so the, the essential question is going to be the key concept. Darwin's voyage provided insight on evolution. The main topic, Darwin's observations. That needs to be written. Your name and date needs to be written at the top of the Cornell note. Now, this picture we have here is a picture of a mole. This mole is blind. It has eyes, but it is blind. Now, well, how does it survive? It uses its other senses. So, has a keen sense of smell, has a keen sense of touch, okay? It probably feels the vibrations of the insects that it eats as they move in the soil where it is. So its other attributes are heightened, even though its eyes have very weak or poor vision. Okay, so our topic is the theory of natural selection. And then our key concept is that Darwin came up with an explanation for how evolution occurs. Darwin did not come up with evolution, folks. So whenever you hear someone saying that, you need to correct them, well, no, Darwin didn't come up with evolution. Evolution has been happening. Change over time has been happening. Whether it's earth changing, whatever it is, evolution has happened. The definition of evolution is change over time. Now, what was unique about Charles Darwin is that he came up with an explanation of how evolution happens. So Darwin came up with natural selection. Natural selection explains how things change over time. All right, so in this country of England, Darwin recognized that the domesticated animals, the domesticated plants, the things that humans have dealt with, whether it was what Gregor Mendel was doing with pea plants, or whether it was what people do with horses and dogs and cattle, we domesticated them and we noticed various little variations, little small changes. Okay, we have different breeds of dogs, all right? And whenever human beings manipulate animals and plants for their benefit, that is called artificial selection. The human is selecting the traits that they want. Who does the selecting for natural selection? The environment. The environment does the selection. That is very important. The environment creates certain situations where either the organism has it or the organism does not have it. The organism is not just going to gain it on the spot. The organism has to have that attribute genetically to deal with whatever the environment presents. Okay, so very important again. Now, what we see here is various types of pigeons. And there are people who breed pigeons. For example, Mike Tyson, famous boxer, he breeds pigeons or used to. And there are other people. I learned uh, in one of my other classes that one of my students said that, hey, yeah, I know someone who breeds pigeons. So we, you know, that's the common pigeon you see in any, any city or whatever it is, okay? But very few people have seen those extravagant looking pigeons. Those are probably ones that you will see at some kind of show or something like that. But they're still artificially selected. Okay, they, they, these are things that humans wanted. Whether you wanted a cockerpoo or whatever designer dog you have, that's kind of like a hybrid between two breeds, that's artificial selection. So as it says with that first bullet, the organisms that have more of the advantageous or beneficial changes, variations or adaptations, you know what happens? They produce more offspring. Okay, they survive in greater numbers than those who don't have the advantageous situation, features, variations, whatever terminology you want to use. We know that then those favorable things are passed on to other things. And that's how it becomes popular, prevalent, abundant in organisms. Now, in nature, organisms tend to have more offspring than can survive. An example is when we talk about insects. Insects have a bunch of, bunch of babies, right? Uh, crabs, they crustaceans, they have a bunch of babies. We see this on either documentaries or maybe you've seen it in person where you see crabs that are, are hatched from eggs in the sand and then there's a time period where they're all trying to rush to the ocean. And then what happens? You have some kind of predator, right? Some kind of predator comes along 
starts eating up the crabs, and then it's just a mad race for survival. Or you have sea turtles being born. Okay, they come out of the sand, out of the eggs, and they're having a mad rush. Well, guess what? The smart predators, and I say smart, the instinctively smart predators, because they're not thinking about it, they have learned the, the habit of those sea turtles. And so they're waiting for those organisms to come out and they are going to try to eat them. You have to be careful with the, oh, whatever it is, because in the natural world, that seagull or eagle or whatever it is that's eating these things, it has babies to feed too, okay? So us putting human emotions in the animal kingdom doesn't work sometimes, doesn't work sometimes. So again, Darwin theorized that these changes, these adaptations are gonna be a passed on um, over generations. Okay, so four main characteristics that make up the theory of evolution. Let me explain them. Variation, okay? We are all born with slight differences. We don't look exactly like our siblings unless we are identical twins. If we're fraternal, we don't look exactly like them, and we don't look like our other brothers and sisters, and we don't look exactly like our mom and dad. We have heritable differences. Overproductions, I explained that to you when I talked to you about insects having hundreds of babies, or crabs having hundreds of babies, or turtles having hundreds of babies. Human beings, we care for our young. So we don't have as many offspring as these other things do. Plus it takes, our gestation period is, is longer, nine months, and it takes longer for us to reach adulthood. Other things does not take that long. It takes a couple of years or a couple of months for certain organisms, or even a couple of days for certain organisms. All right, so adaptations. These are things, little variations, little changes that allow for survival, then those Favorable things are passed on to the offspring, all right? Environment does the selecting. The word natural selection gives you a hint. It is the environment that does the selecting. The environment creates the situation by which the organism has to have the adaptation in order to deal with it. Remember, human beings, we don't do things based on instinct as much. We use our brain power. That allows us to overcome adaptation. Other things, other animals, they are instinctively thinking creatures and therefore they use their instinct. They're not cognitively thinking like we are. Right? Other primates can. Okay? Apes, chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, they can do that. They have the brain power to do certain things. They don't have the brain power to think and come out in a language. Now they do have communication and they do have what would be in a language amongst themselves but they aren't telling us what they think, okay? Survival of the fittest, that means genetic fitness, okay? So not physical fitness. It is, it is, do you have, and I say you meaning the organism, do you have what it takes genetically to be able to deal with the challenges that the environment presents, okay? And if you do, then you're gonna produce more often than those things that don't have those particular adaptations. Okay, this is explained by stating the fact that what we have as human beings currently is what natural selection would act on. We're not growing wings, folks. We could improve our vision, maybe our sense of smell, maybe our hearing, if we ever find the, the genes to be able to do certain things, but things that you know, body part things like that, that we already have, we can improve on that. Maybe our brain power, if we ever figure out what gene causes cognitive ability, all that kind of stuff. But you're not gonna add things to our bodies that we, our bodies don't currently and are not structured to have, okay? I, I always get what ifs. So whatever what if you can think of has to be something that we currently have, all right? That we currently have, we can improve that, so yeah. You probably, could in, you probably could improve those senses that we already have. Now, this panda, the panda only eats bamboo, okay? It does not adapt to eating anything else. So that is why it's not endangered, but it's kind of being watched because 
where pandas live, forests are being destroyed, et cetera, et cetera, and that's their food source, okay? So again, it's going to act on, structures take on new functions, okay? So you can utilize your structures differently, and that's, what, that's part of adaptation as well. All right, so if we look at these pictures here, we can see the variation that is mentioned in the notes. We see two different pictures that shows us two types of Galapagos turtles, and they have the variations that are mentioned in the writing there. One turtle in the green vegetation looks like it has more of a domed-shaped shell. The other turtle looks like an arid type of situation or dry environment, and its shell is different. So these organisms Darwin found are specifically fit for their environment. Okay, their, their physical adaptations, their physical features allow them to adapt perfectly in their environment. And the same thing happened when Darwin saw the finches. There are 12 Galapagos Islands. Okay, it is believed that those finches uh, migrated from the mainland of Ecuador to these various islands. And what's unique and interesting is that each finch found on a neighboring island has features that fit that particular feeding environment. So if you're a finch that needs to feed on termites that you find in some kind of tree or wood environment or other insects, then has a long slender beak. If you are a finch that your food source are nuts, okay, and you need a strong short beak where you can crack those nuts and get the food inside of them, then that's what you would have. So anything that allows for the organism to survive in its environment is termed an adaptation. Now, most species, most creatures in the natural world, they are born with these things. So they're not adapting on the spot like we can. We can use our brain power, our cognitive abilities to adapt on the spot and make changes that other organisms cannot. So if an environmental situation comes along and that particular group of animals does not have the ability to adapt genetically, then they're not gonna change. If their food source is blown away or destroyed and they don't eat and they're not omnivores, because remember, insects, they're herbivores. Cattle, they're herbivores. Okay, pandas are herbivores. So, and they only eat a specific type of plant. So if that, they're not omnivores like us. We're omnivores. That means that we can eat plant and animals. Certain things only eat meat. They're not gonna eat plants. So if their meat source goes away and plants are there in abundance, they will starve to death because they don't eat plants. So any adaptation, any change that happens will be passed on and increased in the generations. And that's how populations change as a whole, okay? That's how species change within the population. Okay, so we saw that documentary we understand that Darwin saw a lot of different things, including fossils and including changes in the earth, geological changes. Traveling all along the Andes Mountains, noticing that there are fossils of things up high in the mountains. And then you're noticing that there are fossils of aquatic things higher in the mountains. Well, there's stuff called, um, there are concepts called plate tectonics and Pangaea where we know that the Earth was at one point one large mass and then over time the continent separated. There are fossils of organisms found on the continent of South America and then the other part of that same organism on Africa because they used to connect, okay? Um, I think it's uh, Brazil goes straight across to Angola, okay? So the Portuguese, they just went just like that, okay? and they went across and they landed in Brazil as just a side note. So all of these things, as we know and as we learned in the, in the documentary, these all added to the information that Darwin was using along with his personal studies and along with writing to other uh, scientists or other naturalists or whatever it is. So he saw all these changes and that led him to say, well, okay, well, if the earth changes and everybody accepts that the earth changes, how come organisms, species, animals, humans, how come they don't change? So again, he's looking at these rock areas and he's noticing these aquatic fossils and 
wondering how those things got to where they are, they are. Well, we know that natural things happen, earthquakes, volcanoes, things shake up the earth. And when you shake up the earth like that, it brings up, brings up old things, okay? Brings up old uh, things that used to be around. So again, he saw these things and he's like, well, hey, if the earth can change, then so can organisms. So uh, again, yesterday we went over the fact that there is much evidence to support evolution provided by science and scientists. So when we go over these things, um, such as fossils, such as DNA evidence, it provides reinforcement for the scientific community about what it is that we are, are studying concerning evolutionary change. Fossils, as we know, provide a very strong sense of evidence. And prior to DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis, we knew that fossil evidence was probably some of the most <clears throat> complete evidence that, that shows evolution. So when we're talking about fossils, and if we're looking at some rock or something like that that has fossils in it, we can ascertain that the rock that is the older layers, okay, the lower layers of the rock, has older fossils in it than maybe the upper layers, which would have a younger age fossils present. Um, studying location, and that's basically what geography is, is talking about, okay, similarities in location. We can also uh, make connections between species as well. So if we have a mainland nearby, like is the case with the Galapagos Islands to Ecuador, then we see that the finches on the mainland and the finches on the islands share commonalities or similarities, okay? Or that the populations show various changes from one island to the next, but similarities to the mainland, then that too can provide evidence that evolutionary change has happened. All right, um, I'll just review it again. Uh, similarities in embryos. Similarities in embryos also provide strong evidence. If we look at embryos from the early stages from various organisms, it is very difficult to determine which organisms they are. And the example that we see here is the fact we have an adult crab and we have an adult barnacle. Both are ocean or sea dwelling creatures and their larva looks identical and the same or we cannot differentiate that. Okay, so similarities in embryos uh, also provide strong evidence for evolution. Okay, so if we look at these structures here, the human hand, the foot of the mole, and the bat's wing all have the same or similar bone structures, and they're color-coded. We can see them with the human hand and the mole's foot, but the bat's wing, uh, because of the coloration, it's a little bit tougher to see that the bones that are in these wings also are color coded the same. So when structures have similar structure or makeup, that's called a homologous structure. So they can have a similar bone structure or makeup, but they can then function differently. So we know that our hands are used for different things than the bat's wing and the mole's foot. Okay, but homologous structures are a source of common ancestry. And if we break this word down like we should have learned and be in the practice of doing, we know that homo, the prefix, means same. Conversely, we have analogous structures. Now, analogous structures do not suggest common ancestry. An analogous structure is a structure that is used for the same thing. So in this case, flight. The fly uses its wings for flight. The bat uses its wings for flight. So that's an analogous or different structure, but it has a similar function. Again, it does not suggest commonality or common ancestry. So any structure that once had a use that is still present in an organism is called a vestigial structure. And we have several that we're gonna see on the next slide, but the ostrich, for whatever reason, over time, has lost the ability to fly, so it does not use its wings for flight. It might use its wings to threaten or to cause predators to go away, but it does not use it for flight. But they can run very fast, though. 
Okay, here are some human vestigial structures that are present in us that are no longer uh, functioning or functioning very little. And there are pictures to go along with them. So we have our appendix, our wisdom teeth, muscles of the ear, tailbone, body hair, especially the, when, it, when, you get, uh, when you're cold or frightened and it stands on end. There's a fold in the corner, semi-lunar fold in the corner of your eye. So all of these structures either have very limited use or no use at all, but they're not harmful. So they're going to keep getting passed on. Okay, so some additional vestigial structures, the sinuses, the erector pili, or goosebumps is what we call them, tonsils, male nipples. Now, there is a process that babies have. It's called the palmer grass reflex. And what an infant has is this immense amount of power and strength to grasp onto things, and it can actually be suspended, okay? Now, other primates, marsupials, they have the same thing, the ability to hold on to their mom or dad's back, okay, or the pouch or whatever it is. So human babies, temporarily, now it doesn't last very long, but human babies have this too when they're first born. Now, when we were in our mom's womb, okay, in that fluid environment, our eyes had to be protected like eyes of fish, alligators, and anything that spends time in the water. So we have a membrane that covered our eyes to protect it, in the, and it's called a nictating, mem, a nictating membrane. Um, technology now is really enhancing and supplementing and proving a lot of what some of the older scientists who didn't have the technology stated, thought, researched about evolution and natural selection. So again, I stated before that fossils provide a very strong piece of evidence for evolution, natural selection, and evolutionary change. And the study of fossils is called, or extinct organisms, is called paleontology. And so the person that studies paleontology is a paleontologist. Remember, ology at the end of something means it's the study of. IST at the end of it means that that's the person that does the studying. So again, paleontology provides strong evidence of evolutionary change. What we have here are ancient pre or ancestors of today's modern well. Okay, and we start back with the most recent 40 million years ago. That is the pelvic bone that we find in a lot of wells, if not most, um, 50 million years ago and 52 million years ago, which would suggest that there is a walking ancestor to the well. Molecular evidence, whether we're talking about genes, DNA, proteins, RNA, whatever you want that falls under this, is the strongest piece of evidence. Now, the chimpanzee and the human are 98.8% genetically similar. You can ask and you can question the uh, how did that happen, but you can rarely question the fact that it is. Chimpanzee, human, 98.8% similar. Now, that 1.2% represents a lot of things, a lot of difference. There's a lot of difference in that, right? Because there's a lot of things that we can do that a chimpanzee cannot do, okay? Like formulate a language into spoken word, okay? Um, yes, chimpanzees and other apes could communicate. They can do sign language, all right? But some of the cognitive things that humans, and in particular language and di dissecting language and creating language, other primates are unable to do. So if we look at the DNA sequences of these organisms, a hippo hippopotamus and a humpback whale, there's a lot of A's, T's, C's, and G's that are similar amongst them. All right, let's look at this word. Pseudo, that prefix either means fake or false, not true, okay? Pseudo gene. So these are pieces of genes that don't really do much. They don't function. They don't really code for anything, but they're carried along with the working DNA, all right? 
And similarities amongst organisms suggest a common ancestry also. Well, you might well ask, well, well, if it doesn't work or if it's not functioning, why is it there? Well, it doesn't harm you. Okay, so it's going to continue to be carried on until perhaps maybe it harms the individual or the group, and then it will get phased out. Because natural selection as a whole promotes survival. All right, Hox genes are master control genes. These genes tell where the thorax is going to be, where the legs are going to be, where the antennae or antennae are going to be. Okay, so they, they tell where the body parts, head, the tail, all that kind of stuff. And they control, you know, through protein synthesis, they control where things are going to develop and how they're going to develop. And so when we're looking at comparisons in protein, we're looking at comparisons in DNA, RNA, all right? These things and the similarities that exist amongst organisms suggest common ancestry as well. So evolution connects biology perfectly. Without uh, being able to discuss, talk about, or study evolution, you really are unable to make sense of why certain things happen in biology and in science in general. Because it does a very good job of giving a rationale or reason for things such as uh, variation in, in sperm, egg that are created from meiosis, uh, randomness, does a very good job of it. And so many different branches of science come together to form uh, and add to the theory of evolution. It's not just biology. Um, this quote is, is a pretty good one because it really does sum up perfectly what natural selection and evolution is and how it works in the natural world. So it doesn't matter how physically strong the, the organism is. It um, doesn't matter how intelligent the organism is either. It matters that if the organism is able to use its genetic makeup to respond to the changes that the environment presents. And it's a perfect example, too, of life as well, because you can apply this to human beings as well. Again, this sums up, you can summarize it, uh, it sums up some key points about natural selection. All right, so the only thing that does the selecting in natural selection is the environment. Okay, there is nothing else. Science does not consider that there's anything else do doing the selecting. Okay, it is a process of eliminations. And so you either have the characteristics or the traits or the adaptations genetically present and you're able to pass those on to your offspring or you don't okay those organisms that are doing the best job of doing that they get more mates they survive in greater numbers and they pass on those successful characteristics to their offspring so it's the survival of the fittest but remember it's the genetically fit not the physically fit to adapt or change to his environment and also luck or chance all right there it says natural selection is not goal directed it does not have a long-term goal so it's not like okay the goal of natural selection is to produce perfectly fit organisms for their environment well that's not the goal of natural selection nature continues to change and present situations and the organisms that are in nature have to be able to change and adapt to it or have the capability to do so. Selection, four are here and I'm gonna explain all of them. So directional selection, as it says, okay, if you think about there being a left, there being a middle, and there being a right, okay, well, directional selection will favor either the left or the right, okay, depending on the trait. Okay, climate gets really cold, 
okay, it's going to favor the benefit to survive in the cold. Climate gets really hot, it's going to favor the benefit to survive in the really hot. Disruptive selection, either extreme. So left and right are favored. Stabilizing, it favors the middle. Okay, so whatever's in the middle, whatever characteristic is in the middle or the average is favored. Sexual selection is, let me give you the analogy of what that is, right? So we all have things that we like about that other person that we like. Whatever the sex of that person is, we have features and characteristics that make them attractive to us. In nature, it's the same way. Okay, birds dance. The male bird is colored or the male animal is colored. The male animal has to bring trinkets or gifts or whatever it is and provide for the female in order for the female to mate. Because generally speaking, in the natural world, the female, for most species, not all, the female does the choosing. Okay, and in humans, same way. It is the female that generally chooses who she wants to be with, okay, in a heterosexual relationship. It varies and is different in other relationships, okay? So sexual selection is just the characteristics that we like about that other person attracting us to that person, and then that's what gets us to that person. We have offspring, and then those same characteristics are passed on to our offspring. Kind of explains directional selection a little bit further. So if we have some characteristics, right? So next size is probably the characteristic being discussed here because it has giraffes here. So we have a shorter neck, we have a longer neck. One of these characteristics being favored more than the other is directional selection. In this instance, having a longer neck in that environment, whatever that environment is, is more favored than having a shorter neck. Other examples would be bacteria that are now antibiotic resistant because we are over abusing the use of bacteria, uh, of antibodies, um, not antibodies, excuse me. We are um, <clears throat> abusing medicine, okay, that are making um, bacteria more resistant. Also, the coloration of moths, camouflages or mimics, and we're gonna see a, an illustration of that, okay, and other uh, sexually selected traits. Stabilizing selection, the extremes are no good. Left, right, not good, the middle works best. Okay, so whatever that characteristic in the middle works best, all right? Examples are clutch size means how many offspring are born to birds. We have the size of antlers in elk, the length of giraffe necks in cer certain instances, and the tails of birds. So again, in this example, it is the middle that is favored and beneficial. So organisms that have the traits that are in the middle will, su will survive more often than those on either extreme. All right, disruptive selection. The middle is not favored. Either extreme is. So both the left and the right are, are, are favored. Now, you might ask, well, how is that possible? Well, the left finches might like to eat nuts. The right finches might like to eat insects. They are not competing, so either extremes, okay? So that's what it says there in that second bullet. Different types of resources cause less competition, and therefore, I got mine, you got yours, we can live together, right? We're not, you're not, you know, you got your money, I got my money, we're living comfortable, I don't got to take yours, all right? I don't have to compete with you for yours, because I have mine. So... On this one, both are benefiting because either extreme, they, they both have what they need to survive. This diagram just gives us, notice how there is not one absolute. They give us four different examples of stabilizing selection, four different types of disruptive selection, and four different types of directional. Specific attention to, because this is a diagram you might see on your test on Tuesday, okay? This is the diagram that resources, books, whatever, generally use to discuss the three different types of selection. All right, directional, diversifying, which is stabilizing, or excuse me, 
and stabilizing selection, which is the middle. Okay. So again, pay spe specific attention to this one. <clears throat> 